About 26 years ago, uh, there was a lot that I did not understand about cooking. And today, I'm going to answer my own questions from 1995, the year before I went to culinary school, and maybe you'll have the same questions today. So, no matter what year your head is in right now, you're going to get some answers on today's Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. It's another Tuesday, and this is the weekly show for the methods, techniques, and insights into better food and cooking. We are live every Tuesday at noon Eastern, except... Next Tuesday, I'll be moving. No Carefree Cooks Code next Tuesday. 70 shows in a row without having to cancel a single one. The last one I missed was October 19th, 2019, uh, because I was in Maui and it was 6 a.m. there, so I wasn't going to do that. So, no show this coming Tuesday while I move, but... If you want to see most of the past videos, go to the archive on Facebook. Everybody should get together at noon next Tuesday and watch one of my videos. Go to facebook.com slash chef.todd.more slash videos and you can check out some of the ones that you might have missed. And if you want to see what I'm cooking and how I did it when we're not live together, follow Chef Todd Moore on Instagram. This is a lemon pepper chicken I did the other night without videotaping it. There's no video, um, but I do describe on Instagram how I did it. Lemon pepper uh, chicken. How do I do this stuff? Well, y'all know why. I'm a carefree cook. I create my, did I just y'all? That might be a clue. Um, I create my own recipes. I bring my friends and family together. I learn every time I cook. I wind up creating my own cooking style. Why? Because I practice pro methods and I wind up loving my cooking. And that's what we're all about, right? We are all on a journey together toward true freedom in cooking. And it's not always easy. <laughs> not, not every journey, not any journey, I would say, is. And you know, so often along anybody's journey, at any time, there's some point you get so exasperated, you wish you had all the answers immediately. Just, just, <clears throat> just tell me the final answer. But that's really not the way the true enlightenment, true empowerment works. I'm going to show you a portion of that path today because I had a lot of cooking questions about 26 years ago before I went to culinary school and I needed some answers. It was driving me frankly quite crazy and blah, 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 blah. Y'all know how it, that was my second y'all. What is wrong with me? Well, you guys know how that worked out for me. So I'm gonna tell you that story today. But first, I've got a true or false for you today. Tell me in the comment section below, is this statement true or false? Cooking in aluminum pans increases your chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. True or false in the comments section below. Uh, you know, in 1995, I was thinking about going to culinary school. I, I was just starting to work it over in my head. I had a career. I had a very lucrative job. Uh, I had just met this amazing woman named Heather. Um, who knows if that'll go anywhere, right? <laughs> it was the job that didn't work out. Um, you know, I really enjoyed cooking back then, but honestly, I sucked. I, I just, I wasn't very good at it at all. I, I didn't even think I was good at it. I knew I had a lot of problems and this brought about so many young novice type questions that came from the brick walls in cooking that I was hitting. Every time something went wrong, I stood there in disbelief. How, how could this have happened? 
why? Why? Why, why did it go wrong? In my frustration, I would take out a random scrap of paper, anything in the kitchen, and I would write down this question. Why? Why did my dish burn? Why is this so bland? These are the questions that in my frustration, I wanted to shout out loud. I was so frustrated. But instead, I wrote them down on a piece of paper. And I put all the pieces of paper in this wooden box. And I buried it in my backyard because I knew that one day I would eventually figure these things out and maybe I'd be able to answer those questions. I was thinking when I buried this box in my backyard that the future chef, Todd Moore, would be able to answer all the things that are driving 1995 just plain old Todd Moore crazy about cooking. All right, so if you're buying this right now, um, I'll continue to tell you <laughs> that I had long forgotten about this box with all my cooking questions and frustrations from 1995 until recently, would you believe it? When I remembered I had buried this box more than 26 years ago and I went out in the backyard and got it. Okay, you, you still with me? <laughs> you're, you're digging this? All right, good. So I went and I wanted to dig up this box of cooking questions from 1995 before I went to culinary school, before I changed my life, uh, before I started this whole journey, before I even met Heather, I buried this box, all right? So I go there and well, they put up a parking lot where my backyard used to be. I, I do live in downtown Baltimore after all. So I had to go get some jackhammers and some buddies. So with the jackhammers and with some heavy equipment and a backhoe, we finally got the box out. And when I opened it, there they were. There were all these scraps of paper with my handwriting on them. All the questions from 1995. Do, do you want me to read them? Do, do you want to hear a few of them today? These are all the things that I wanted to know about 26 years ago. And now we're going to see how far I've actually come. Let's see if I have figured out <laughs> any of the answers to these questions in 26 years, because this is going to be really embarrassing. This has a potential to be really embarrassing. If I still don't know the answers after more than a quarter of a century, after some really big executive chef jobs, after owning my own catering company for many years, opening a, a brick and mortar cooking school, uh, starting an online cooking school that's more than 12 years old, being invited back to my alma mater as a culinary school professor and earning my accreditation as a certified culinary educator, and I still don't know the answer. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I might be setting myself up for something really, really embarrassing. But look, maybe these are the same cooking questions that you have right now. Maybe they're at the start of your journey and you don't want to go to culinary school and you don't want to spend decades figuring it all out like I did. Today, I could be saving you 26 years of frustration. All right. <clears throat> So if you're going with the whole Johnny Carson routine here, let's see <laughs> what I wrote to myself back then. <laughs> you are right, sir. Yes, yes. I'll throw a little Ed McMahon in there. Okay. From 1995 Todd to future chef Todd. Let's see. What did I write? Why doesn't my chicken get brown like the photos I see in the recipe book? Ah, oh, that's, that's an understandable beginning question. You always see these recipes with this beautiful brown chicken or browned beef or something. And of course, the recipe, I didn't know this in 1995, but I know it now. Of course, the recipe is, always says something about sear the meat or brown the meat or something like that. It's always one of the first steps and they never really explain about this. Now, here's the key to browning. 1995, Todd, are you listening? Here's the key to browning meat. Moisture prevents caramelization of sugars. Now, 1995, Todd, he didn't know anything about the four effects of heat on food, all right? Chef Todd, he learned about that along the way, and this is the key to all of cooking. Caramelization of sugars is browning. Evaporation of moisture is steam. Any steam prevents browning. So, 1995, Todd, 
if you want your chicken to be brown, you got to dry it first. If you're going to do saute, direct heat, even grilling, you don't want the item to steam. You want the item to brown. So always dry things on a paper towel. Make sure, make sure your protein is really dry if you want something brown. And of course, you have to control the heat too. Wow, good question, 1995, Todd. Let's let's see. Let's. You want to pick another piece of paper out of the box? Let's let's see what else I wrote to myself. I was watching Emerald's TV show. Oh my goodness, I used to watch Emerald. Mm. Um, and he made a Cajun flounder. Of course he did in a sauté pan. And I've tried the same dish three times, and the fish always sticks to the pan. Is this just the magic of television? I can understand why 1995 Todd was frustrated about this. Delicate items sticking to a pan. This is the bane of everybody's existence. This is why people use non-stick Teflon pans, no matter how scratched up they are, no matter how much Teflon you have eaten, you will still use that pan instead of a great stainless steel pan that conducts the heat better. You know why? Patience. 1995, Todd, just be a little bit more patient, number one. Uh, home cooks that, that aren't patient, like me back then, would put the fish down and start scraping at it already. Number two is using enough heat, and it's because there is a process for saute. Pan hot first. Test the pan, 1995, Todd. Put some water on your fingers, Psh, see it turn to steam, and then you visually can tell the four effects of heat on food. So test the pan, make sure there's enough heat. Have enough patience to achieve the caramelization of sugars. And how do you do that? By drying the fish. Good, two questions in a row, 1995, Todd, that go together. Dry the fish, use enough heat, heat the pan correctly, have some patience and use enough fat. Use the right type of oil to prevent it from sticking as well. And don't smoke the oil. So these are all steps in the nine steps of the basic saute method. And 1995, Todd, it's coming soon. It I would say by 1997, you will have learned the nine steps in the basic saute method. And that's going to help you a lot. All right. Another question. Let's, let's stick our hand into the, into the virtual box. Let's see what else I wanted to know. 1995, Todd, what else he wanted to know? Will I ever learn to dance the Macarena? Yeah, okay, I guess we worked that one out. Uh, next, uh, beside the free salad bar, the free dessert bar, and the free breadsticks bar, the steaks at Beefsteak Charlie's. Oh my goodness, do you remember Beefsteak Charlie's? Anybody Northeast U.S., the, the Beefsteak Charlie's, it was a free everything bar, pretty much. <laughs> you bought the steak and you grazed. You know? Oh, so 1995 Todd wants to know, what's the secret behind a great steakhouse steak? You know, and I can understand this one as well. And it kind of goes with the previous questions. First of all, make sure the steak is dry. If you're going to grill it, broil it, or saute it, direct heat, um, you're, it goes to searing it, giving it that nice plate appeal, right? Caramelization of sugars we just talked about, one of the four effects of heat on food. But if your steak is really thick, like th those steakhouse steaks, you are not going to cook it into the middle the way that you want it to be when the heat is only applied by the grill or the saute pan or the broiler from above. It's going to burn on the top or the bottom before it gets into the middle. So 1995, Todd, the way they do it in these steakhouses is they use a combination heat. They sear the item, they brown the item, then they finish it in an oven under convective heat where the oven, the indirect heat, helps cook it into the middle uh, without uh, cooking it more on the top. Last time I drank water, it was a disaster, remember? Okay, what else you got for me, 1995, Todd? This is the box that I buried in my backyard in 1995 when I was very frustrated with cooking and I had all these questions. Well, recently, a bunch of buddies and I, we got jackhammers, we dug up the streets of Baltimore and we got the box back out. And I wanted to know 
Why is steaming only used for Asian food in bamboo baskets? <laughs> yeah, I had the same questions that so many people starting their culinary journeys do. Now, again, you don't have to go to culinary school. You don't have to become a professor at your alma mater. You don't have to open catering companies and have huge exec jobs. You don't have to do any of the things that I've done to answer these questions, but they're the same questions. You could see I'm at the start of my journey. So what is it with the steaming method? You don't have to have a bamboo basket to apply heat in an indirect moist cooking method. And that's what steaming is. The same way your oven is an indirect dry cooking method, the heat doesn't really touch the item like it does in a pan or on a barbecue grill. That's the same way with steaming versus like poaching, poaching direct contact with the heat, steaming indirect. So here's the answer, Chef Todd, uh, before Chef Todd from 1995. Um, you don't need a bamboo basket, just support whatever item you're steaming above the steaming liquid. You can do this with a strainer. You can do this with a baking rack, like a cooling rack that you would put your cookies on. Trap the steam and create that convection. But no, it's not just for Asian food and it, it's not just in a, a, a bamboo basket. Uh, cooking vegetables this way, best way to cook vegetables because there's no added fat. If you're gonna make a burrito, 1995 Todd, and which is stuffing in like a tortilla and then drying it out, baking it again, poaching or steaming your chicken might be the best thing. Learn the steaming method, 1995 chef, 1995 pre-chef Todd, and you'll know, boy. Okay, what else? Uh, wouldn't it be a lot easier to chop an onion with an onion chopping device instead of a knife? Oh my God. I really had no religion <laughs> back then. No, absolutely not. You don't need gadgets to cook really well. No matter what part of the cooking process, whether it's cutting or sauteing, you don't need the best knife. You, you don't need chopper devices. You don't need Instapots or rice cookers or all these things that people convince you that there is a problem with your rice and the only way to solve that problem is by buying their rice cooker. It's just not true. People have been cooking rice without rice cookers or crepe cookers or Instapots or sous vide sticks or, or crock pots or any of it for a long, long time. 1995, Todd, you are going to become a purist. <laughs> you are going to shun all the chopper devices and you're going to learn knife skills. You're going to learn. It's one of the first things actually you're going to learn. There's going to be this chef in 1995, Todd, the first semester of culinary school. He is going to be really, really mean. He's going to yell at you all the time, uh, but you're still going to make it through. So don't worry about that. What a jerk that guy was yelling at first year students with knives in their hands. Nonetheless, like, you know, 1995, Todd, you know, your neighbor that has all the gadgets. Do you remember the time that you were at her house and you're going to help her cook and you both got out an onion and that she had to go get the chopper dicer device off the top shelf and then it doesn't quite fit together and the blade doesn't quite go in and she's fiddling with it and then she got to take out a knife to cut the onion in half and put it in the chopper dicer device anyway and, then, and, and you were done cutting the onion before she even had the thing put together. You know, that's the other thing. And the knife, one part, easy to clean, wipe dry. No, 1995 Chef Todd, gadgets do not take the place of developing skills. You'll learn that. Uh, what else I got? How am I ever going to make a good cheese sauce without Velveeta cheese <laughs> and a microwave? Uh, this one is true. <laughs> Actually, those were my sauces back then. Melt Velveeta. And if you don't know what Velveeta is, it's a processed, fake, non-food, cheese-ish product. It's just terrible, nonetheless. All right, 1995, Todd, one of the keys to all of cooking is learning about thickening agents thickening agents and liquids. So it is going to blow your mind. I think it's not till the, like, the third semester of culinary school. You're probably talking 1997 or 1998. So wait two more years back then, Todd, because you're going to learn about roux, how to make a good roux, and then add a broth to make velote or add milk to make bechamel. And those are the basis to almost every sauce. If you learn how to make a dark roux, 
and a dark beef broth, you're gonna make espanol sauce. So there's this thing called the mother sauces, the five mother sauces, 1995, Todd. Once you learn them, you're gonna make every sauce. You're gonna be making up sauces like crazy. And today, Todd, 2021, Todd, uh, yeah, that's, I, I make up, I make like a cup of sauce. Like people always ask me, how long will bechamel sauce last in your refrigerator uh, until I'm done eating it? <laughs> that, that's, I only make about a cup or two. Nonetheless, uh, let's see what else 1995 Todd had to ask future Todd in this box of questions that I buried in my backyard. All right, what's the next one? How does Amazon think they're ever going to make any money just selling books? That business is destined to fail in the computer age. Hey, look, you can't be right all the time. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't a sage back then. I, I didn't buy Amazon stock when, when I had an opportunity. I thought it was a dumb idea selling stuff on the internet. I mean, who's going to buy things on the internet when you can just go to the mall, right? See, we've all learned. Uh, 1995, Todd wants to know, one cookbook I have says add water, but Martha Stewart... I, Okay, I like Martha. Martha's okay. <laughs> Says to add milk uh, to my eggs for the fluffiest omelet. Which should I do? Oh, we just covered this recently, right? And I showed you, I mean, it, it really comes down to milk has lactose. Milk has milk sugar and sugars burn. So if you want to make a brown omelet or brown scrambled eggs, you are much more likely to do it when milk burns than water. Water leavens, water turns to steam and leavens. The fluffier omelet is the one with water, but we just covered that. So 1995, Todd, he was, probably wasn't making very good omelets. He was making brown omelets, right? Burning things. What else did he want to know? Uh, how come if I pour wine into a saucepan, it doesn't make a wine sauce? Oh, you got a lot to learn, <laughs> Todd, in, pardon, in 1995, because, and, but it's a common misconception. You do not make a sauce out of wine, okay? This, this, people think I sauteed vegetables, and I know 1995 Todd thought this as well. You saute vegetables and you pour a whole bunch of wine in it, and then, I don't know, you cook it a little bit more, and then you pour it on your pasta. You don't make a sauce out of wine, right? There's a lot of problems with that. It's highly acidic. Um, it's hard to thicken. You, it, it, acids inhibit the gelatinization of starches, so you can't make a roux and red wine. Uh, it's just gross, okay? But 1995 Todd didn't know this. Here's how you deal with wine. In the nine steps of the basic saute method, there's a step called deglazing. And if you have sauteed your protein product, sauteed the vegetables, you have a nice fond on the bottom of the pan, 1995 Todd, who probably has already burned the fond by now by not coming off the heat. People think it's more gas, more gas, whether you cook on electric or gas. People think it's pedal to the metal in cooking. You got to come back, back, back on the heat to protect that fond. So 1995 Todd has a burned black fond in the bottom of the pan. He's going to pour in a whole bunch of wine, count to 10 and call it a sauce. 2021 Todd, or even, <laughs> well, actually 1998 Todd, by the time he learned it and graduated, um, he knows that the, the, so the wine is made to deglaze the pan and then reduce. You have to evaporate all of that wine until it's what we call au sec in French culinary, almost dry, so that you get the grape of the wine, not the acid, not the, the tart part of it. Deglazing is meant to lift the fond from the bottom of the pan and be the foundation of your sauce. Now that after it's reduced, add some beef broth, add some chicken broth, vegetable broth. That is a much more flavorful foundation for your sauce. That, that's the way it is. All right, there's only a few more in, in my box from 1995 here. The next one, if I decide to live the life of a chef working every night, every holiday in a hot kitchen for low pay, God, I wasn't very optimistic back then, was I? Will I ever have the money to buy the expensive cuts of meat like filet mignon or rack of lamb that we serve in the restaurant? Ha, huh, good question. A lot of restaurant workers go through this. They, they watch these meals that they can't afford to buy. It, it's, uh, I'm not gonna get going on the way restaurants are. Uh, oh, wait a minute, there's more. This is a long one. If I'm always gonna be poor, what cut of meat should I buy? Okay, 1995, Todd, that's two questions. First of all, your cooking is gonna be so good that you can spend the money on those more expensive cuts because you're not afraid of messing them up. 
You have confidence to know what to do with them. You apply the right cooking method to the right uh, cut of meat. And it, you have creativity. So like you're excited to, to get a, a fancy product. You're, you're excited to have duck flown in, in a box, in a cooler, not ducks, never not. Um, it's only, only pigeons <laughs> around here. You're excited to get lobsters flown in. I know lobsters don't fly. Again, it's the plane. But nonetheless, you become confident, so you compare that to what you would pay in a restaurant, and you do it for like 20% of what you would pay in a restaurant, and you do it better, 1995, Todd, so you're not going to worry about those expensive ingredients. No matter how much money you do or don't have, you seem like you feel like you're destined for, for chef poverty, which is probably the case, uh, but don't worry because you're cooking. And if you follow your culinary journey, your cooking will get better. You'll want to cook those things. The other thing is, okay, let's say it doesn't work out for you uh, back then, Todd, just starting your career and you know, you're making barely minimum wage. Then you need to focus on the braising method. You need to focus on the cooking method that takes those cheaper cuts of meat and turns them into something delicious and tender. Just last night, I made that pork adobo dish again. It's un freaking believable. It like, I time travel. I want to go back to 1995 and, and just tell Chef Todd, pre-Chef Todd, about pork adobo. That, that's all I want to do. So it's braising that makes the cheaper cuts more expensive. Okay, getting down to it. This might be the last one. Is it, What is it? Will there ever be anything more powerful than Windows 95? <laughs> it's really fast and my AOL dial-up modem says that I have mail. All right, forget that one. Um, will I ever find the perfect recipe? <sighs> that's the question that I had for myself in 1995. No, Todd, don't bother. Don't bother looking for the perfect recipe. It doesn't exist. It is never out there. And if you think you found the perfect recipe, you cook something, you say that's perfect, you'll cook it a second time and it won't be. Because 1995, Todd, what you got to do is learn the cooking methods. You have to learn the step-by-step, -step, repeatable, dependable, re reliable methods that no matter what you cook, it comes out. Because then you have creativity and confidence. Then you do fly in the expensive ingredients. Then you know about the mother sauces. Then you know about thickening agents. Then you know about the nine steps in the basic saute. You know steaming method. You know braising method. All these things all work out for you. 1995, Todd, I'm so happy for you. It all works out, so let's get rid of that box. Oh my God, enough of these questions. Let's bury it back in the backyard and maybe we'll visit it again in, in another 26 years. No. <laughs> oh my, all right. So now what I want you to do, that's funny. Um, now what I want you to do, I want you to look back over your shoulder. Okay, I want you to look back on your own personal cooking journey and, and what your motivations are for becoming a carefree cook. Gauge your progress along the way. Be aware of your successes. Celebrate your successes. I mean, you used to spend a lot of time thinking about your failures, didn't you? I, I know I did. All those questions were about why things failed. Well, try to spend more time thinking about how well you're doing. Try to think spend more time thinking about the things you've learned rather than the things that you still don't know. So if you're a carefree cook, if you're a lifetime member of web cooking classes, when you first joined our community, was there a baffling question that you now know the answer to? Embrace that. Love that. Hug that. Good for you. You figured it out. It's a notch. You should take a minute and be really proud of yourself. Did you always cook with a non-stick pan because you couldn't figure out how to get the food to stop sticking? And now you have this great stainless steel pan and you control the heat like a pro? Good for you. That's a problem. That's no longer a problem. And that's what a cooking journey is. It's a path. It's a path to toward getting rid of doubts, R replacing your doubts with confidence. It's a path of discarding uncertainty and replacing it with confidence and creativity. It is the one road that leads to true freedom in cooking. And it's where you'll find all the carefree cooks at the end of that road all hanging out. So if it took me from 1995 to today <laughs> and I'm still trying to figure it out, 
you need to start that path as well because it may never end. But the fun part is, it's fantastic for the whole way. All right, let's get to the true or false today. Would you stop with this, please? On their own website, go to alzheimers.org. On their own website, they say this is false. It is not. I don't know where it started, how it started. Please stop telling me that aluminum pans cause Alzheimer's. It is just absolutely untrue. Go to the Alzheimer's site and Google that. People talk about not wanting to eat in restaurants because of the aluminum pans or whatever. It, it, don't worry about it, okay? Go to the Alzheimer's. I'm, I've heard that like a dozen times this week. That's why it worked on me. And look, if you know someone who's been asking themselves the same cooking questions and seeking an answer over and over again, please like, share, love this video with them. And while you're doing, post it on the rest of the internet so everyone can benefit from today's code. Isn't it time also that you take your kitchen on a food vacation? I mean, most of us, including me, we can't travel like we used to, but we can still take our kitchens anywhere in the world that we want to. And this whole idea of global flavors in your kitchen, going places while staying right where you are, that's the idea in this week's free online class. It's called Food Vacation. Three steps to taking your kitchen around the world. You can register for this brand new free class at webcookingclasses.com slash vacation. Hey, thanks for being with me today, everyone. I so appreciate it. I gotta go bury that box again and start writing down questions for Chef Todd 26 years from now. Until then, uh, but not next Tuesday, don't forget, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your cooking success. Bye, everyone.